Okay, so good evening, everybody. Or as Michael Will says, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And, <laughs> what we're going to do today is we're going to get on to the second part of metaphor. Do you remember last time we gathered information and I drew that picture of Pat and the way that she was thinking and where her uh, pictures were and where the sound was and where the feeling was? So, so I'm presupposing now that you've done step one, so you've gathered all the information that you need to know the structure of where the person is now, where they want to be, and some sort of transitional steps to get them from where they are now to where they want to be. So the next step is then to build a metaphor using that information. And in order to build the metaphor, or well, step three is to tell you, which is what we're going to do the next one. So we have to tell them. So, 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 so in terms of the build your metaphor, the first step is to choose a context. So if, for example, uh, some of you may have done the exercise, uh, if you were a uh, famous uh, rock star, imagine a famous rock star, if you were a type of carpet, what type of carpet would you be? If you were a type of furniture, what type of furniture would you be? If you were a drink, what drink would you be? If you were a day of the week, what day of the week would you be? These are all ways to choose a context for your metaphor. The purpose of choosing a context is to make the story sufficiently dissociated from the person that their imagination can run a bit free so they can get new ideas. Sometimes when you're doing change work, you find that if, it's, if people are quite literal in the way they interpret what you're saying, you can use the meta model and some modalities and all those things, but somehow you don't quite get to the point where they suddenly see new opportunities or new possibilities. So, so once you've chosen the context, you're then going to populate and plot the metaphor so it's isomorphic with the information that's gathered. That means it has the same structure. So if there's five people in the present state, you'd want to have five characters in your metaphor. So if you're using furniture as an analogy and you have five people, then you might have a chair, a table, uh, a chest of drawers, a wardrobe, and a um, stool. So that would make it isomorphic with the uh, basic um, uh, existing uh, present state. Uh, over here, you might have a newly upholstered set of furniture, or a new French polished set of furniture, or something that would signify a change you'd have from here to here. Uh, uh, what you would also want to be able to do is, uh, in terms of the plot, most good stories have beginning, middle, and an end. Now, when you're using a metaphor, then typically the end will be a resolution. So, in other words, in this process, going from here with the plain furniture to here, the new <coughs> French polished furniture, they've got some resources have been added here in between, not with the middle bit. So, you've got the beginning middle bit where you have the resources and then the end. Um, and in terms of that uh, result, you would also want to be able to what's called recalibrate the strategy. And recalibrate the strategy basically means that people have the strategy that holds them here. And you're going to redesign that strategy so that it gets them to a different outcome or different goal here. Um, <coughs> and the in which you can redesign the strategy you're going to get to in a moment. Uh, you also uh, clearly want to know what the desired goal or state is. You want to have listed this very completely. One thing that I have noticed in change work, especially where it's associated with a, with a job or with another role, is often you're determining what the desired state or goal might be. Even if you've clearly just decided what the desired state or goal might be, it's still really useful to list it what the other person wants. So you can try and back the two across to each other so you get a win-win outcome where everyone gets what they want. Uh, when we did the workshop today, I started out by saying, so what do you want? And several people in the room said, oh, you're supposed to tell us what we want. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, well, yeah, okay, I can do. And I'm also interested to know what you want so that we can make sure that they match up where we get over here. Uh, this is real, in terms of when people talk about empowerment, Part of empowerment is the other person's goal is taken into account into the desired state over here or the desired goal. It's just about your goal, then often the other person will still be over here somewhere. It doesn't matter massively, that kind of thing. Um, and then, 
with the part is to reframe the, uh, the original problem situation so that it's no longer a problem. So if you were to have uh, this poor chair over here, it was all there, no one had French polished it, no one had bounced it, it felt really unloved. Uh, it was sitting there in the kitchen feeling desolate and disconsolate and generally unhappy with the whole situation. And it started to weep gently onto the floor. <laughs> Little late! <laughs> Moments later, suddenly a duster appeared. The chair said to the duster, Hello, duster, do you know where there's some French polish? The duster said, Oh, I know where we can get some French polish. It's up there in the highest cupboard. How are we going to get it down? So they looked around and they looked around everywhere. And they couldn't see the obvious because it was too obvious. So they start to listen to everything that's going on around them. They could hear the ticking of the clock. They could hear everything that was going on, but somehow the obvious still eluded them. So then the dust went, I know, I'll go on an exploration. So the dust had a look behind the kettle, and around the back of the kettle was a cup. And the dust said to the cup, Hello, cup, do you know how we can get up there? He said, oh, you just need to wait. Just sit there quietly. And then someone will come in and put you away. <coughs> so, so they just wait and wait and wait and nothing happened. And then suddenly, something large emerged from the sky, grabbed hold of the duster and put it in the cupboard where the polish was. So the duster had a chat with the polish and said, hello, polish. Do you think we will be able to get down? They went, oh, we'll have to wait until the person that takes us out. So they waited, and they waited, and they waited, and then they waited enough, and they went, oh no, we're not going to wait anymore, we're going to jump and hope that a parachute will emerge. So the dust had tied itself around the top of the polish, <laughs> jumped out of the cupboard, and it slowly floated down onto the floor. So the dust had got out of the polish, and the polish of the French polish, and French polish the chair, and they all lived out there. <coughs> <laughs> so that's an example of how you would utilize the metaphor using this information. Obviously, I didn't elicit it. It wasn't totally like morphic with your. Uh, and there's some additional information here that you can add in there in terms of tier category, rep systems, and some modalities. I added in a fair bit of rep system information. I didn't go really deeply into the sub modalities. I didn't use that. I thought they kind of did, I sort of used placator with like the tears to kind of placator and that's it. So that's how you build a metaphor.